Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our author series here at the Corrales Community Library. I would like to thank our friends of Corrales Library Group for sponsoring our Zoom Pro platform for this free virtual event. It is such a pleasure to have with us tonight, Dara Seville, as she presents her book, The Ecology of Herbal Medicine, A Guide to Plants and Living Landscapes of the American Southwest. Dara is the founder of and primary instructor at Albuquerque Herbalism, as well as the executive director of the Yerba Mansa Project, which is a local nonprofit in Albuquerque, New Mexico, focused on ecological restoration along the middle Rio Grande. Welcome, Dara. Thanks so much for having me, uh, Sandra, and thanks to Corrales Community Library for hosting this event. It's so nice to be able to have um, these events and to have been able to have planned them during this time. Um, so I'm really grateful for this opportunity and um, thanks for everyone who is joining the meeting here tonight. It's nice to um, be able to connect in whatever ways are possible these days. So thanks for being here. I'm gonna go ahead and, and um, dive right in. I always feel like there's never enough time to, to talk about plants. And um, I will just say that I love when people have questions. And so I would really encourage you to um, ask questions. Um, I've got my chat window open so um, I can see the questions come in and um, I'm gonna go through a few different plants. So if you have questions, just type them as they come up and um, I'll, I'll answer them before I move on to the next plant if I if I see that your question is relevant to what we're talking about. And then, um, of course, I'm always happy to have a little bit more discussion at the end if if um, anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask a question, then we can we can do that at the end. So um, as Sandra said, my name is Dara Seville and um, I wrote this book, The Ecology of Herbal Medicine. Um, it is really um, partly an expression of my love for the place that I live and um, also um, an expression of my desire uh, to have a really nice reference book about some of the most important plants of the American Southwest, plants that are important to us biologically and ecologically, but also plants that are very central to our cultural heritage. And so um, these are the plants that make up the Materia Medica of my book and um, preceding the Materia Medica, there's also um, several introductory chapters that give a lot of um, ecological botanical stories about the land of the Southwest and um, sort of setting up this idea about learning um, learning about medicinal plants by learning about the land and the plants habitats and their ecological functioning and how that helps us to understand about plants as medicines. And so um, that's a little bit about the book, but um, tonight I really just wanted to share some of my favorite plants with you. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I wanted to start off with a plant that I think most people are familiar with. It's one of the most famous herbal medicines of human history. Uh, this is yarrow or Achillea millifolium. Um, as I said, this is probably one of the most famous medicinal plants. If, if you don't know many, um, you probably know this one. Uh, it became really a legendary plant in part because it's one of few plant species that is native across the northern regions of the globe. So many people around the world, um, many cultural groups um, from different continents across time and space have known and loved this plant and incorporated it into their healing traditions, into their ceremonies and rituals, and into their everyday lives. And so this is a plant that I love to start off with. I love to talk about because I feel it is um, something that unites human um, cultures and herbal traditions around the world. It's something most of us have in common. And also because of that, it's a plant that most of us, no matter where we're from, um, are going to be able to find an ancestral connection through this plant. And so I think that's pretty cool too. There's a lot of ways to connect with plants. There's a lot of reasons why plants attract us into their lives. Um, and um, you know, connecting with our ancestors is just one, one 
one of many reasons. But um, yarrow is a beautiful plant that is native, uh, as I said, across the northern areas of the world and um, has been such an important healing herb beneficial to so many different body systems that this herb just has such legendary status. Um, like I said, I do like to talk a little bit about plant ecology and what we can learn about plants by understanding their habitats and their environments. And one of the really cool things about yarrow, and this is true of other plants too, but um, there's a fair amount of studies on yarrow um, relating to their environmental conditions that um, help us to see that, you know, depending on where yarrow grows and its environmental conditions, it actually changes some of the medicinal attributes of the plant, um, depending on the elevation, um, depending on how much sunlight or shade it gets. It, the plant can actually produce um, different kinds of chemicals in varying amounts, which can affect its uh, medicinal um, actions in the body. So the plant's relationship with its environment is really, really important. And that's just one example of how we know that to be true. But Plants um, produce their, their medicinal properties really for themselves because they want to survive and thrive in their localized environmental conditions. And when we work with plants from our local environment, then we're getting the absolute best medicines for us because we're getting plants that are responding to their environment, which is our environment. And we're getting medicine from plants with whom we have co-evolved in our local environment. And so we share a lot more than we might feel like um, on the surface. And so um, yarrow is so cool in so many ways. It's one of the oldest known um, herbal remedies and human traditions of, of healing. We have um, archeological evidence taking us back 65,000 years to Neanderthal times um, teaching us about human relationships with yarrow. Uh, there's a grave found in Iraq from that time period, 65,000 years ago, um, that shows uh, a person in a ritual burial with yarrow and other plants. Um, we also um, have found in Neanderthal teeth, yarrow remains, we, so we know that they were chewing on this plant. And um, if you've ever chewed on yarrow, you know it's kind of bitter. It's not something I think most people would choose to do for flavor or for fun. So to me, it really suggests uh, medicinal use for yarrow and also um, being found in a grave um, suggests a ritual and spiritual connection with this plant as well. And then continuing on, um, there are many, many uh, stories about yarrow in human cultures around the world, as I said. Um, if we fast forward from Neanderthal, Neanderthal times up to the 13th century, um, we find yarrow playing a prominent role at the Siege of Troy and um, mythological stories of that era Yarrow was used to heal some of these warriors at some of the most famous battles in, uh, in ancient European storytelling. And um, there's also a Roman ship from the first century, uh, which shows that yarrow was found in a context of other healing herbs um, on a sunken Roman ship bottled up with other medicinal plants. And so we have an implication or a suggestion there that this was being transported as a valuable um, healing commodity during that time. And so um, we have this, this, this long history um, from many, many cultural groups. And then, you know, taking us up to more, more recent times, closer to recent times, yarrow also played a really important role in, in medieval cultures. Um, yarrow was strung up in doorways, um, along with some other really famous herbs like St. John's wort and vervain, which I'm going to talk about um, in a little bit. Uh, these herbs were used for magical protection against, um, you know, witchcraft and supernatural spirits and um, evil mysterious forces, things people couldn't understand but frightened them. And Yara was used to help uh, protect and keep people safe during times of increased supernatural activity. And um, I like sharing stories like that because I think it's easy for us to say, oh, well, 
you know, that's from a bygone era, you know, or these are old wives tales or whatever. But in reality, those stories are really relevant to us today because um, we still have things we don't know and understand. Um, we still have things that are beyond our control that frighten us or cause us to have anxiety. Um, and so it's nice to remember what did our ancestors do with their fear of the unknown and the things that were beyond their control in their lives. and and um, to find that connection um, with the people who came before us by using herbs in the same way. And yarrow certainly has um, a lot of those same uses today. And we may talk about things in different in different ways, you know what I mean? We don't always talk about witchcraft and ghosts, but we do you know, have a new paradigm for talking about those kinds of things, anxiety and mental health paradigms, um, you know, where yarrow still plays a role in many, many kinds of healing traditions of both the physical body and the spiritual body. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, I think that's what people are most interested in is how are these herbs used by people to maintain, build or restore um, good health. And so I'll just start off by saying yarrow is a really common plant. It grows in many different habitat types. And so it's an herb that I do like to encourage people to work with because it's common in the wild um, and has a very widespread distribution. And it's something you can easily grow yourself. Um, so I encourage people to, um, to grow herbs themselves and to also um, wild craft or wild harvest herbs that are common and abundant and widespread with healthy local populations. And Yarrow certainly fits that description. It became famous in modern um, herbal traditions really as a first aid herb. So you've probably heard a little bit about Yarrow and know that um, it's a great herb to stop bleeding wounds. And that's um, kind of its claim to fame and why so many people know about it, but that makes it, that alone makes it really worth having in your garden right outside. You know, if you cut yourself with a knife in the kitchen or something like that, it's really nice to be able to just run outside, grab a piece of yarrow, you could just bruise it in your mouth a little bit or bruise it in your hands a little bit and put it right on and it stops bleeding very, very quickly. And um, that use too also gives it a little bit of a misleading nature. People think of it as an herb that stops bleeding when in actuality, it's an herb that regulates the cardiovascular system, which makes it such an important herb. Herbs that have these balancing components that can um, regulate body systems, they can do opposing things. Remember we talked about how herbs are responding to their environmental conditions, um, more or less sunlight, higher or lower elevation. Well, they're responding also to the environmental conditions in or on your body as well. And so um, herbs are intelligent um, whole plants that can respond um, based on the conditions that you're presenting for them. And so um, um, while yarrow is really great at stopping a bleeding wound and disinfecting a wound, um, it is also for the cardiovascular system a regulating herb. It can actually increase or decrease blood flow. It can attenuate that. Um, through vaso, um, vasodilation or vasoconstriction. It can um, adjust that through your blood vessel walls. It can also um, attenuate um, the capillary action and help to release or, or conserve heat in the body. And so it can do these opposite things because it's seeking balance. That's what it's doing. And so um, we may see it as stopping bleeding, but actuality, it's like, oh, a bleeding wound, I need to stop that. But that's, um, that's its response to those particular conditions. And so um, yarrow is really an excellent herb for the cardiovascular system, helping to regulate blood pressure. Um, it's great um, for things like varicose veins because it can tone and tonify the blood vessel walls. And um, it's also an excellent herb for the respiratory system too. Um, this is an herb that has an astringing quality, which means that it helps to properly distribute fluids in the body. So you don't have really wet areas like in the respiratory system, for example, you could have um, a lot of really wet mucus and marrow can help to, to dry that up and expel that mucus. Um, you have conditions like that too in the digestive system where say, um, you know, maybe your small intestine isn't wringing out all that water and reallocating it to the body. And then you have something like diarrhea going on. Um, Yarrow can help 
to regulate that and help the body to properly reabsorb that water so you don't have that symptom. In addition, in the digestive system, yarrow is really bitter. So um, bitter herbs help to um, increase salivation. They can help to increase um, the gastric secretions that break down your food. They can also help to increase that smooth muscle peristaltic action. And um, also um, in the digestive system, yarrow helps to regulate blood sugar so that you um, have that um, um, response to properly digest your food and, um, and not have uh, that uh, glycemic response. So um, yarrow is a very, very useful herb all around. If you were to look it up in any ethnobotanical books, you would see that it's one of the herbs maybe challenged only by juniper um, as having the longest list of uses by people who have known and loved this plant since time immemorial. And then one last thing I'll say, because um, I could talk about yarrow for a long time, just kind of giving you a little taste of yarrow tonight, but um, like many herbs, we're finding that preliminary research on yarrow and many other herbs is showing um, a strong um, suggestion that this would be a great um, preventative or treatment um, added into cancer therapies. Uh, there's a lot of growing evidence showing that many herbs, including yarrow, can be anti-proliferative or cytotoxic to cancer cells. And so yarrow is um, included in that body of research. And um, if you guys have any questions at all, please um, feel free to put them in the chat. I'm gonna finish up with yarrow by just saying that I do harvest, and I have one more picture to show you. Um, I do harvest these leaves and flowers that you see. And um, um, the flowers are the best part, but I also gather leaves as well. And I prepare this as a tincture, which is, um, a combination, it's an extraction that's into a combination of alcohol and water. Um, most plants have uh, medicinal compounds that extract into water and into alcohol. So a tincture is a nice way to capture both of those in one sort of convenient um, way to dose somebody. You only, you know, you measure a tincture in drops. So usually, you know, it's just one, one little sip in a splash of juice or water that you're taking. So it's really convenient for people and um, it captures both of those kinds of compounds. And um, I also really like uh, to dry some yarrow for tea. I will include it in tea blends for cold and flu or digestive, um, like a post-meal tea, uh, that type of thing. And, um, and it's a little bit bitter though. So, you know, most people aren't gonna wanna drink yarrow all by themselves. Maybe if you like bitter things, um, then that would be fine. But usually I mix it with some other good tasting herbs like chamomile or mint or whatever. And then also I really like to use yarrow as a topical and I like to make an infused oil. Um, the infused oil is excellent for um, using um, just as a nasal swab for people who get nosebleeds, which are kind of common in the high desert more so than in other areas, but it's a great remedy for bleeding nose. Um, and also that infused oil is a nice remedy for um, making like first aid salves and balms and things like that. Or you could use it for um, varicose veins, like I mentioned, or lots of other uses too. And then a question came up in the chat, can yarrow be used as an infusion? Absolutely. So I would just take the dried leaves and flowers and put them with whatever herbs I wanted to combine it with in my teapot pour some boiling water over it and um, it does make a good tea, especially, you know, when you're using it for um, cold and flu um, and it can be really helpful, as I said, that regulating effect in the cardiovascular system. Remember I said that you can use it to um, release heat or conserve heat um, through the capillary action and diaphoretic action, which means opening up the pores to sweat which yarrow can also do for you. Um, and so in that way, yarrow can be really useful for regulating fevers. Um, if you have kind of a low grade fever and you wanna bump it up just a little bit into that effective range, 
where it's actually working for you, then you can use yarrow um, in that way to help regulate a fever. You can also bring a fever down. Um, yarrow has that balancing attenuating effect for fevers as well. And so for cold and flu, a tea is great because you really want to keep people hydrated, want to give them something warming um, and relaxing. And so teas can be really nice in that way. So if you have any other questions, go ahead and put them in there. I'm happy to answer them. In the meantime, I'm going to move on to globe mallow, which globe mallow is just one of my favorite plants. I love this plant so very much. Um, it just shouts its most joyous joyousness at me every time I encounter it. I feel like I'm just happy every time I see it. It's that kind of medicine for me. Um, just looking at the picture is really mood shifting. <laughs> so um, I hope plants do the same thing for you. Uh, whenever I, I see a globe mallow, I, I re-remember to tell people there's so much herbal medicine that we could never put in a bottle or a jar. There's so much um, healing and happiness um, and restoration that occurs through the relationship that we have with plants. So um, that's always a reminder when I see someone that I love <laughs> like Glow Mallow. And then um, I will say that um, with Glow Mallow, um, this is a plant that I also really love teaching because it's, um, we have a lot of species that are really just native to the southwestern states because glow mallow likes hot and dry conditions, which we have plenty of. Um, but also, um, there is one species um, called Sferalcia coccinea that is wider ranging across all the western states and plain states. And so um, that's one that is a great one for wild harvesting because of its wide range uh, and distribution. But in the Southwest, um, uh, there are quite a few globe mallow species, which you will commonly encounter. And globe mallow likes to go in a wide variety of habitats. We have lots of dry, hot habitat types in the Southwest. And so you'll find globe mallow in the foothills and the bosque and the mesa. You'll find it in open, sunny mountain meadows. Um, it's just a plant that you're going to keep encountering again and again. And this is another one that you could easily cultivate if you are a gardener and would like to have this growing. Um, chances are you might just have it by accident because it is a wildflower that does um, like to colonize any dry areas that you might have on your property. Um, and um, this is another herb that is um, really important ecologically, like all of them. They have their important ecological roles to play, but globe mallow is very closely connected with many of our native bee species and helps to support them. And um, this is another herb that has a long history of use in the Southwest in particular, where we have a number of species uh, in a variety of habitats of our region. In fact, um, globe mallow was found in a ceremonial context at Chaco Canyon. So we know that it was revered or we believe um, that it was also and still continues to be revered for reasons beyond just um, the, the kinds of informational healthcare things that we're talking about here today. Um, but, you know, maybe you saw the look on my face when I saw this plant, but this plant um, means more, <laughs> more to me um, than, than the, the ordinary healing herbs. Um, so globe mallow is part of our, our cultural heritage. It's part of our biological um, cultural landscapes both. And so um, I just, just really, really love glow mallow. Um, so glow mallow is one of those herbs that um, I would say just has an incredibly long list of uses, sort of like yarrow. It's hard to just sort of encapsulate it in a short talk, but um, I, I think of glow mallow really as possibly the medicine of our times. If I had to pick one herb um, that I feel really represents this modern era, I might pick glow mallow. It's, it's hard to just narrow anything down to one herb, but certainly a strong candidate because um, yarrow um, responds to this increasingly inflamed environmental conditions that we're creating um, and is, um, you know, an herb that really kind of calms the inflammation in the landscape by growing everywhere under, under a variety of conditions that we're creating, hotter and drier. And um, glow mallow is okay with that and proliferating in that. And um, glow mallow responds similarly in our body 
bodies, um, it responds positively to our own inflammation in our bodies. And as we create more inflammation environmentally, um, we also are experiencing more chronic inflammatory conditions. Um, those kinds of diagnoses are rampant and um, most most people either have them or know someone who has them. And so um, chronic inflammatory conditions are something that Glow Mellow is really excellent at helping with. Um, like yarrow, Glow Mallow is another herb that is seeking balance. It can attenuate. And so it can actually do opposing things. When I was the first you know, young herb student, many years ago, I was so confounded by this idea. How can an herb, you know, um, both um, help the immune system to function better and, and calm it down? How, how can an herb both, you know, release heat and conserve heat? That just, you know, was something that took me a little time to understand. The more I understood plants as intelligent beings, the more that made sense to me. And so, um, as grounded as I am in science, um, I do always put that idea forth that plants are intelligent beings. And um, that is why whole plant medicine is so effective and um, so different from other kinds of medicines that are made from isolated compounds that no longer have their balancing components with them. So um, back to the immune system uses of globe mallow. Um, globe mallow is excellent for people with chronic inflammatory conditions of any type because glow mellow helps to balance and regulate the immune system response. So if you're someone who has a very overexcited immune response, your immune system's responding to all kinds of things that doesn't need to respond to, um, glow mellow can actually help to calm that response down and take the edge off of that. It, it is um, <clears throat> seeking to more effectively coordinate the many aspects of your immune system response. And so um, likewise, um, it can also do the opposite thing. If you're someone who gets sick all the time and you have a hard time recovering, you maybe are plateauing in your healing process or you just keep getting sick um, very frequently, then glow mallow can actually help to um, organize your immune system to have a more effective uh, and more robust response. It's not stimulating like something like echinacea is, but it, um, it has this immunomodulating effect that can calm the immune system down or promote a more robust response if that is what is needed for your body. And so glow mallow is just excellent in that regard. Um, and so I use it so very much. I use it for everything from allergies and arthritis um, to um, like Crohn's disease and celiac to um, people who um, um, get sick frequently or have recurring ailments or um, don't seem to be able to finish off their healing process when they get sick, they, they, they can't quite recover fully. So um, all of that is makes glow mallow so useful. And then one other thing that I will add about glow mallow is, and the mallow family in general, which includes many members, um, these herbs and glow mallow um, are very demulcent, meaning that they are cooling and moistening to hot inflamed tissues. So that could be the outside of your body. You could have, um, you know, something like um, a, a rash or bites or stings or, um, you know, eczema or psoriasis or something like that, which would fall into the chronic inflammation category, but on the surface of the body. Um, excellent for cooling hot inflamed tissues. And then remember the whole inside of you is also soft tissue. So um, really healing for things like acid reflux where you need cooling and moistening to calm that down. Um, really healing when people are producing too many gastric secretions and they, they could be having mild ulcerations or really upset stomachs from, from that. Um, and so, you know, useful inside and out. And globe mallow is really water soluble. So I really encourage people to make a cold infusion out of this. Um, so we talked about making an infusion out of yarrow, but in this case, the mucilage, that slimy slippery substance, which is cooling and moistening of the soft tissue can be damaged by the heat of boiling water. So I recommend that people um, make the tea 
using cold water and put it in your refrigerator for a couple of hours in a sealed container. And then you'll have a really nice cold infusion with that soft, slimy, slippery substance. And it'll be excellent for um, balancing that immune response. And then um, you can also pro further process that into a tincture if you want to, but I always do the water extraction with globe mallow. And I mainly collect leaves and flowers um, but if I find a really abundant stand or I'm kind of weeding it out of my own yard because I have a lot of it, um, then I'll harvest roots too. Those are also really medicinally active as well. But um, I don't always like encouraging harvesting roots from wild stands because then, you know, you're, you're um, potentially damaging that population or um, taking that plant's whole life. So if you don't need the roots, then you don't have to gather them. But um, if you have a lot of it and want to or need to weed it out of your yard, then, then get the roots too. Um, and then um, have this other little um, slide here with globe mallow. And so the picture on the right is showing you that Spheralcia coccinea species that I mentioned, which is really much wider ranging um, across all the Western states and, and into the plain states. And that Spheralcia coccinea species on the right is a, a shorter, shrubbier um, species. It only grows maybe a couple feet tall Whereas the other species I know have this really long and leggy structure, like you can see there on the left. Um, they're quite tall and leggy and um, have a more erect type of structure. So um, those species are more relegated to the Southwest and can be very abundant in our local area. So um, I'm gonna scroll back here and look at what's popped up in the chat. Um, so one is going back to Yarrow. Um, contraindications for yarrow. So that's a great question. Um, I can't think of any contraindications um, that are coming to mind right now. Um, if anyone really wants to know, I would look it up in my botanical safety handbook to double check and see if there's any literature on that, but I can't think of any contraindications right offhand. As a general rule, um, you know, there are a lot of herbs. I'm not sure if we're going to talk about any tonight, but I'll mention it if we do. As a general rule, I, I always try to think of herbs that are really stimulating to the liver, which yarrow isn't particularly. Um, those herbs can sometimes interfere with um, the processing of medications. And so for me, that is like, um, I think the most common contraindication for herbs um, and we don't have a lot of information about how herbs interact with drugs. So sometimes that can be an issue, but I think with Yarrow, my answer is I don't, I can't think of any right now. So I think that would probably be okay. Um, and then there was another question um, um, on to globe mallow. It's known to help balance the body. Would it be considered an adaptogen? Um, yes, I think, you know, in a looser sense of the word, not strictly though, because Adaptogens don't um, have specific herbal actions in the body and, 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 and globe mallow does, but it can be used like an adaptogen. And um, I would say, you know, I would consider it more of a tonic herb. That's how I would describe it most accurately. It's a tonic herb for the immune system and it has active demulcent uh, properties as well. And so the, there's a little bit of a difference between an adaptogen and a tonic, which I don't feel like we really have time to get into the subtleties of those definitions, but they are similar in that they, um, they are seeking, seeking balance in the body, but tonics have an affinity more for certain body systems, and they do have specific herbal actions like glow mallow. And then um, Mariah asks, is glow mallow safe to use during pregnancy? Um, I can't think of contraindications for pregnancy, though I am very cautious during pregnancy and usually will recommend a very short list of herbs for pregnancy for general use. And then um, if there's a specific condition or health concern that would warrant expanding that list to other herbs, um, then I would look at that on a case by case basis. But um, I can't think of any specific activity for globe mallow that would be an obvious problem with pregnancy. And I think that, you know, if you're using it 
appropriately um, and safely, then um, it shouldn't be a problem during pregnancy. And then um, one more question about, is it easy to propagate from seed um, with globe mallow? I would say yes, although the seeds are really, really small. So they can be a little bit of a challenge to gather and, and um, propagate with them. But um, globe mallow um, spreads pretty easily by seed in the landscape. Um, I've had um, some different species just blow into my yard and establish themselves, which I was happy about, <laughs> but um, um, I haven't grown globe mallow myself by seed, so I don't have that personal experience. It's just my observations about, um, about it in the natural world. So moving along here to verbane um, or verbena, we have a number of verbena species. Um, what you see here is um, the verbena hostata, which is a species that likes to grow in wetter areas. So it's not as common in our local environment, um, but um, I have seen it in the bosque and it is really pretty. And um, we also have this species here, which um, is verbena mcduglii, which is named after a botanist. Um, but this is um, a species that's more common in our area and the one I work the most. This one um, likes to grow in middle elevation mountain environments. You can see its habitat on the left. Uh, this, this species likes kind of open, sunny, drier areas in these middle elevation mountain environments. And this is another plant where there are different species of verbenas, closely related plants that grow in other continents and um, can help us connect with our ancestors wherever they, they might be from. Um, and there are stories about verbena and human relationships around the world. So um, it's just a really cool plant in that way. Um, Verbena is also another plant that is very important to native bee species in our area. And again, a plant that has this rich, rich history of botanical lore associated with it. Um, uh, many, many cultures of the old world viewed this as a highly, highly sacred herb. Um, over there, you have a species called Verbena officinalis, um, but um, closely related to ours, the Mesopotamians, the Greeks, the Romans, um, the Druids, medieval Europeans and modern people um, all knew and loved this herb and considered it to be one of their most sacred healing remedies and spiritual allies. And there are many stories about it and many ceremonies um, where it featured prominently. It was used for decorating altars and woven into the crowns of goddesses and queens. It was used for enchantments and evil spells and also for all manner of um, bodily and spiritual healing. Um, the Greeks told stories about it in relation to Zeus and Aphrodite. Um, verbena was used in love charms and um, was said to be such a potent um, um, enchantment herb that it could resurrect lost love and turn enemies back into allies. And so um, the belief in the power and potency of this herb um, was so strong. Um, the Romans used this to decorate their altars in a special ceremony called verbenalia. Um, it was used um, to decorate ships going into battle to protect them and keep them safe. Um, high ranking officers used it as a badge of their authority. Um, and then, as I mentioned with yarrow, this was an herb that was used to decorate doorways and um, keep people safe during times of increased supernatural activity and the risk of um, evil influences and things like that. Um, priests would soak it in holy water and sprinkle it around. It was um, used in incense for exorcisms. So the protective spiritual properties of this herb are so strong and there's so many stories. I mean, there are even stories about this being present at Christ's crucifixion and being used to heal his wounds. So I, I can't think of another herb 
serve with this level of respect and honor and potency in traditional herbal medicines around the world. And I've, I've shared a lot of old world stories because I find that lore interesting and my ancestors are from Europe. And so um, I know a lot of those stories, but um, there are many stories from from our area as well that go back um, innumerable generations with the people of this land. And so I love plants like this, which connect me with um, my ancestors and where they're from, but also connects me with where I am and where I'm rooted and where I live and connects me to place and the traditions of here and now. And so this is an herb that really does that for me. And um, I really love this herb personally as well. And um, so what I do with this herb as a healing remedy is I collect leaves and flowers. This is another one you can cultivate in your gardens and is just really, really pretty and um, supports native bee populations and pollinators in your garden. And um, so I collect leaves and flowers. Um, I mostly prepare this as a tincture because this herb is a little bit bitter. Um, you can make it as a tea if people are willing to drink that, but if people are um, not into bitterness, then they might not like it. I have mostly worked with children um, and, and women in my herbal practice. And so I'm really big on compliance and getting kids to take things. And so I'm a little sensitive to how bitter things might be and whether I'll get compliance to that. So um, I like to use this um, in many ways. One of the sort of forgotten uses of this herb in modern American herbal traditions is for the urinary system. This was a legendary and top use for it in old world healing traditions, um, which just didn't um, take root as much in American herbal traditions or indigenous traditions here. But um, it is an herb that is known to be diuretic, um, moving to the urinary system and to help to break down stones and gravel that form in there. So if you're prone to um, urinary stones, this might be a good herb for you. Um, also um, really beneficial to the digestive system. As I mentioned, it's bitter. So the things I said about yarrow being bitter apply here to vervain. Um, it's stimulating to all the digestive secretions in the mouth, in the, um, in the gastric, area, um, promoting that um, peristaltic action in the intestines, reducing symptoms of indigestion by increasing the efficiency of your digestive system and your body's ability to properly absorb, uh, to break down and absorb nutrients. And then also a very important respiratory herb. Um, this herb um, is, is um, very useful for cold and flu. It's antiviral and can, it's warming and relaxing and has that diaphoretic action that opens the pores to release heat. And it's anti-inflammatory for the lungs. And so really useful as a respiratory herb. And I would say perhaps it's most famous and widespread uses in modern American herbal medicine would be for the nervous system. This is an herb um, that I would say is a top herb for um, calming, an agitated, stressed out nervous system. When we feel like our lives are kind of out of control and we respond by trying to control um, something in our lives, you know? Um, you know, I notice sometimes if I'm really out of balance, for example, I just make an example of myself, maybe <laughs> I'm also talking about you or someone you know, but um, you know, if I'm really out of balance and not taking care of myself and I'm kind of stressed out, I'll notice I start trying to control little things in my life that just make me seem like I'm being a jerk. You know, I'm like bossing my kids around about where they've left their shoes or, you know, just something stupid like that. You know, when I realize that I'm trying to control things in my life and I, it's just not necessary, then, you know, I'm like, oh gosh, I really need, I need that vervain <laughs> in my life, you know? And so when you have this sort of nitpicky bossing, controlling type behavior, which is a natural response when your life feels stressed out and out of control. And maybe a lot of people have felt like that over the last year, this can be a really good, useful herb for kind of helping to take the edge off of that irritated, overworked, stressed out, exhausted nervous system. Um, and so um, I really like this herb for that purpose. And um, verbena is just another one of my personal favorite herbs that I'm happy to be able to share with everyone here tonight. 
Um, and if you have any more questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I'm going to move right on here to Russia and Olive. Um, I like to throw in a non-native invasive species. Um, this is a tree that I think a lot of people, um, especially you know, if you live along the Rio Grande, you, you probably hate this tree. <laughs> a lot of people really do, and you know, for a good reason. Nobody wants to see this tree taking over the habitat of our beloved cottonwoods. Um, it does form, um, in many cases, vast monoscapes because we've altered our floodplain habitat and ecosystem functioning so severely that um, our native cottonwoods, for example, have a hard time reproducing now. And um, non-native invasive trees like this are taking their place. And so um, there's that real negative association and emotional um, process that we have as herbalists for working with this plant because of its ecological role, which is so unappealing. Um, but as an herbal medicine, this is a really important plant. When we look at the ethnobotanical literature going back to Asia um, and the Mediterranean where this plant is native, the people who have known and loved it forever in those regions um, have many, many really important medicinal uses for it. And so, um, you know, we can look to those people who know it and love it and don't have all this emotional baggage to work through. And we can learn about how um, it developed its medicinal properties in its original environment. Now, um, you know, we don't know how those medicinal properties might be somewhat altered in a new ecology playing a novel role in this environment. But um, there are many really important uses for this plant, um, including that um, the leaves, the bark, and the berries, the fruits that it produces, are all medicinal and can be harvested. The bark and leaves are harvested earlier in the growing season around this time of year, and then the berries are harvested at the end of summer or early fall. Um, you got to get them before the birds do, but um, you wait until later in the season to harvest those berries. Um, the berries are really high in antioxidants, or the olives, I guess they are <laughs> technically, um, but they're really high in antioxidants and, um, and all of those um, plant parts, the, the leaves, the bark and the berries are antimicrobial. So they're active against a wide range of different um, pathogens that can make you sick. Um, they're also very pain relieving. Um, we have um, ethnobotanical documentation and we have a lot of scientific research on this plant too that backs up um, the use of this as a pain relieving herb that in many cases in clinical trials was shown to surpass the efficacy of over-the-counter pain relieving medications and some steroid medications. And so um, a very effective pain relieving herb that reduces inflammation and is a muscle relaxant. So um, that's how it, it is pain relieving by reducing inflammation and relaxing muscles in the body to relieve pain. And additionally, um, this is an herb with a really important use in the cardiovascular system. It optimizes blood flow. So it can actually, again, increase or decrease blood pressure and can regulate blood pressure for people who have that dangerous condition of oscillating high and low blood pressure. So I don't know many herbs that do that, but um, that is a traditional use of this herb and one that is backed by scientific research. Also, um, another herb that is useful for the digestive system um, it helps to lower gastric acid secretions. So we've talked about a few bitter herbs tonight, yarrow and vervain, that can help to stimulate those gastric secretions, but some people produce too, ma too much of that, and this is one that can actually help um, to lower that and protect against ulcers and things like that in the digestive system or help to reduce um, um, indigestion that might be a result of that. So. Um, a really, really useful herb. Um, and so as a, as a person who works in native plant conservation and restoration, who, um, you know, as the director of the Yerba Monster Project, we do 
native medicinal plant restoration and habitat restoration in the Volske. <laughs> I have a hard time with this plant in that sense, but as an herbalist, I think this is an amazing plant to work with. And I have this kind of dual relationship with it, but um, even its ecological role, I can um, you know, not hold it against the plant personally, because I do realize it is simply responding to the environmental changes that we have created. And so I have moved past my um, scapegoating of this plant and blaming this plant for being here and have accepted that it is here through um, the result of our relationship with land and water. And um, since it is prolific and um, since its population is increasing and its range is expanding, we as herbalists should be working with this as an important healing remedy that um, can help us or people in our lives. So um, here's another photo of Russian olive just to give you um, a chance to see what the leaves and what the immature fruits look like in summertime. So the fruits that you see here are not ripe. Um, they're still developing. Um, later in the season when they are, are ripe, they look more white in color. Um, and so that's when you would wanna pick them um, at that time of year once they've, um, you know, gone through their full developmental process. Um, and then, um, as I said, they look a little bit more white and they, they do have a really big hard seed in them, but they're a little, like a little bit sweeter tasting later in this season. And then a question came in, um, Russian olive infusions for blood pressure, leaves and bark. Um, yes, I would use that. And I would also always prefer to include some of the fruits if you can. Um, what I normally do is I harvest the bark and the leaves around this time of year. Springtime is really the best time for harvesting bark and the leaves are present at the same time. And then I'll dry all of that and, um, you know, I dry all my stuff in a brown shopping bag. And then um, once it's dry, I store it in a glass container. And then at the end of summer or early fall, I'll go out there and I'll pick those berries too and I'll grind all of that up together and then make my medicine after I've gotten the berries. The berries being so high in antioxidants um, are something I would want to include. Um, I think their medicinal benefits are probably pretty important. We're still learning a lot about the importance of antioxidants, but we know that, um, um, that they actually reduce the biological markers for many degenerative um, ailments. So I would recommend waiting to get some of those and including them if you can. Um, um, that would be my suggestion. I know sometimes we just need things now and waiting for three months or whatever is, is hard to do. But um, anyhow, um, please keep putting questions in the chat if you have them. Um, I'm moving on to um, our last plant for the evening, which is mesquite. Um, this is a plant I, I also really enjoy and I wanted to make sure I, I represented the, the desert as well as the mountains and the floodplain, natives, non-natives. We've, we've got a little sampling of everything here. Um, and um, mesquite, you're looking here at the velvet mesquite, which is more of a tree. This one's not as common in our local Albuquerque area, but um, you can find it uh, planted and it is a Southwestern native. Um, but this one's more of like a tree species. And you, this picture here, you can get a good look at its leaves and these gorgeous bean pods um, here in this photo which um, the bean pods I'm going to talk a lot about um, and we'll also talk about the leaves. But here is another photo showing you the honey mesquite, which is um, the species that's more shrub-like and really common in the southern half of our state here in New Mexico. Um, so um, this is a plant that I, I think is just really, really fascinating. Um, you know, ecologically, it's really important. This um, plant hosts an extraordinary number of bird species, both resident and migrant birds rely on this um, and other wildlife as well. And it's incredibly, impressively desert adapted. Um, the most amazing part of this plant is happening underground where we never can really see it and appreciate it. So I want to just illuminate that for a moment because it's so incredible. Um, 
mesquite is so desert adapted because of its root structure. Um, its roots commonly go 40 feet down in search of um, subsurface water. And if there's an aquifer to be reached, it will get there. Some mesquite roots, um, tap roots have been measured as far down as 190 feet below the surface. That's remarkable. Not many plants have that kind of desert resiliency. And if that's not enough, um, if there isn't subsurface water to get to, mesquite will instead spread out 60 feet long lateral roots from the center of, its, of, of, it, of the plant to get any precipitation or surface water that might be available, however temporarily it might be there. So a really impressive desert survivor, um, a plant um, like glow mallow that I know is going to move with us into this hotter, drier future that we're anticipating. Mesquite is a plant that's going to make this um, this journey of climate change with us. And in fact, it has a fascinating story in the landscape already. It's been here for thousands of years and has witnessed a lot of climate change already. Um, if you can take your imagination back to the Pleistocene times when megafauna were roaming the continent, Mesquite was there and witnessed that. Um, in fact, um, it is theorized that um, during that time period, mesquite populations actually expanded in the Southwest and they became more dense in the landscape because of the megafauna eating the nutritious and delicious seed pods, pooping them out into a pile of fertilizer and helping to propagate them across the landscape. And then <clears throat> as the ice age receded and um, humans um, became a more um, dominant personality and character in the landscape and their effects started to um, become more uh, measurable in the land, mesquite populations ebbed. So um, people used mesquite as a fuel. There weren't very many things to burn for firewood. So mesquite was used in that way. And also um, um, mesquite, you know, was something that was sustaining to human populations. So the bean pods, as I said, are highly nutrient dense. Um, they are really important to nutrition for people living off of the land. Just like pinon nuts sustain the people of the Four Corners, mesquite pods sustain the desert dwelling people of the Southwestern basins. And so um, hugely important, but its relationship with humans caused the population to ebb. And then with the introduction of cattle grazing 150 or so years ago, um, we had um, another expansion of the population because once again, cattle were eating these bean pods and have been helping to propagate it in the land. And so we have something that we now sometimes call brush encroachment and I'm using air quotes um, because it's sort of an economic term. Um, to do, it's like sort of like a derogatory term for a native plant because we view land as a commodity, an economic commodity that um, in this case, rangeland is more valuable if there's more grass and it's less valuable if there are more woody shrubs. And so as um, our land use and our relationship with land helps mesquite to expand, um, we start using these kind of derogatory economic terminology with our native plants um, because you know, we don't value them just as plants in the landscape, we want to use our land for money making. And so um, that, you know, sometimes causes us to talk about native plants using these kinds of terms that I feel are unfairly applied, but um, it does sometimes um, apply to mesquite. So um, that's a little bit about the history of this plant's relationship with the land and with us. And then as a food and medicine, I will just say briefly that, um, um, you know, the, as a food plant, so important. As I said, it sustained the indigenous people of this land since time immemorial as one of the most, if not the most important, important food source of this region. And also um, that, conti that continues today in um, modern wild food foraging traditions. Um, people still like to eat mesquite and it is one of my favorite wild foods. Now grinding these pods is tough at home unless you have a hammer mill, but you can buy 
mesquite flour that's already been ground for you. And it's delicious and nutritious. Um, I'm a vegetarian, so it's one of um, the ways that I add protein to all my baked goods. Um, it also adds a delicious flavor. Now it has a very strong flavor. Um, so I usually recommend that whatever your recipe, however much flour your recipe calls for, I usually recommend sticking to about 20, maybe 25% mesquite flour, and then use whatever other types of flour you would normally use for the other 75, 80%. Um, but um, it adds a delicious flavor. You just don't want it to overpower the flavors of everything else. And also, if you eat too much mesquite, it can cause gas and bloating in some people. So you don't want to do that. Um, but uh, I love to use this for all kinds of things from quiche crust to cookies and pancakes and muffins, whatever you're baking that includes flour, um, mesquite might have a role in that. And then um, also, it's an important medicinal plant. The leaves and the flowers and the pods are all medicinal and are an excellent antimicrobial, um, which is useful for wound care treatments or internally for fighting infectious pathogens. And also for the digestive assistant, um, as for the digestive system, it's very astringent. So helps Remember we talked about um, in the small intestine, reabsorbing that water and reallocating it to the body. Mesquite is really good at doing that in the digestive system and also in wound care treatments. If you have bleeding wounds, it could be helpful for regulating that fluid as well. And as a digestive food medicine, whatever um, you wanna call it, it's both. Um, it helps to lower blood sugar and lower total cholesterol. So many of our staple wild foods, including mesquite, really do help to regulate important digestive processes for better overall health, um, for better foundational health through healthy digestion and absorption of nutrients and regulating our most critical body systems. So mesquite is a really important plant ecologically, a really important plant to the story of people of the Southwest. And mesquite is another one of those plants with native species on other continents that can link us to our ancestors no matter where they might be. So um, mesquite is another really cool plant that I think is sometimes underappreciated and undervalued. And um, I just like to um, have this opportunity to share Mesquite's story with you here today. And um, I'm just going to check in the chat here. Um, 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 there's a question about Russian olive, preparing it as a, as a tincture or a tea. Um, with Russian olive, I, use, I mostly make tinctures and elixirs. Elixirs are a combination of brandy and honey. Um, and so I like to do that with medicinal fruits, like the Russian olive, for example. Um, but tea, um, I haven't made that, but you could. The leaves would have to be an infusion and the bark would have to be a decoction. So you, you know, you'd have to make two teas and combine them. So that might be a little challenging unless you just wanted to use one or the other. But I like to do the tincture or the elixir. And then um, Patricia says, La Montanita Co-op announced in their email Monday that you'd also be giving a talk on Thursday, the 27th on native medicinal plants. Is that correct? Yes, it is. I'm giving another free talk on um, native uh, medicinal plants for New Mexico gardens with the Santa Fe um, um, Master Gardeners this Thursday at 6 p.m. Uh, and if you want that link, um, you can email me at Dara, D-A-R-A, -A, um, and I'll, I'll just put that um, in, the, in the chat here. My email is Dara at Albuquerque Herbalism. Um, so you can email me at that address and I'll send you the link for Thursday's free event at 6 p.m. on native medicinal plant gardening if you'd like to join me for that. And um, in the meantime, um, here's my book. Um, there's tons of information in my book on all of these plants and more. There's 39 plants in the Materia Medica plus five introductory chapters. And um, if you enjoyed this class here tonight, I teach on a regular basis um, through albuquerqueherbalism.com. You can find all of my upcoming classes. Uh, we have a new full semester of herbal studies starting on August 24th. 
which is going to be in person here in Albuquerque. And um, so you are welcome to sign up and have a whole semester with me and um, also some classes with my, my colleagues. And um, also, if you are local and want to get involved in the Yerba Monster Project, we do native medicinal plant restoration in the Bosque. Um, we organize our community to do active restoration work and our next volunteer field day, finally we're returning to that too, is going to be on Saturday, September 18th, and you can get the information at yerbamansaproject.org. And if doing that work isn't your thing, um, we always welcome your um, support through donations or corporate sponsorships um, to help us provide all of the free services that we give to the community through restoration and also through um, providing free programs for the community and for school classrooms. So you can support us in that. And um, I thank you all for joining me here tonight. Um, I tried to squeeze a lot into one hour and I hope that um, it was really informative and that you enjoyed this evening. And I hope we can connect in other ways in the future. So um, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to uh, Alice um, Community Library for hosting this event. Well, thank you, Dara, for sharing your time and knowledge with us tonight. I learned so much. And thank you all for joining us. Good night. Have a good night, everyone.